Welcome to the Good Vibes Podcast with Clark M. Pistato and Ryan G. Boom! Here we are again. Let's just start it out like that. Let's get crazy today. I just took my first sip of my vitamin B drinks. I'm feeling good. I, I'm I'm with you. You know that massive boom. Can you imagine me in the car and the speaker? You, I think you just Holy scared the shit, shit out of the driver. Monday morning, you <laughs> asshole. Sorry for all you people in the cars. Yeah. We will tone it down a little bit and we'll put on our jazz voice. Fuck that. We're go. We're put on the five finger. Let's let's <laughs> let's crush this. <laughs> let's do it. Well, I'm excited about uh, today's show. Yep. We have an awesome guest, and so we're gonna get to. Uh, Explore some creepy shit, I have a feeling. So I'm I'm kind of digging this one. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Me too. I've, I've, I've only <laughs> tested the waters of this world with my toes, and I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. you know, I, in my former life, I used to book people into jail, and, uh, and the guy that we're going to talk to um, worked beyond the jails, and so it's going to be kind of a, a dark, creepy journey for a little bit. But I'm sure we're going to find some humor in it, so don't that's, worry. That's so cool, because if you think about it, you know, that's where your journey ended and a whole nother journey started, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And being a cop, you really, you, you don't dive into that part, you know? Mm -mm. It's You drop the, the piece of shit off. I was in and out and as quick it. as possible, because exactly. it was creepy. It was like, okay, here's your dirt bag, gotta go, <laughs> bye! <laughs> it's like the but, Ghostbuster with the containment system, that's right? Very simple, really. A loaded trap here. Open, unlock the system, insert the trap. <laughs> hey, just hand it off, man. All right. Yeah, I know, but I had a lot of respect for people that uh, work in the monkey house, as they call it in Thailand. They call it the monkey house. So, oh, um, a Thai prison. Good. But, oh, God, dude. I actually read a book about that. There was a, a, a drug trafficker from Australia that got snatched up, and he did 11 years oh, uh, in the, what do they call it, the Bangkok Hilton or something. It was their worst prison and it was just like especially as a foreigner it's kind of like being a gringo in a mexican prison like you're already yeah i know against the wall dude and the stories he it was a very good book um i can't remember the name of it anyway it was a great book but yeah it it really kept me on the straight and narrow in thailand like i don't want to end up there dude it, <laughs> I don't think what I you would did do well. was on the straight and narrow those are some fantastic <laughs> laws there <laughs> yeah they are by thai terms i was well behaved which I will be honest. I, I was not well behaved, <laughs> but my daughter's in the next room, so I got to be careful all about right, Thailand right. stories because we'll, we'll she actually, there. you know, is from there. She knows. Oh, I know, Daddy, bad oh. man. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> all right. <laughs> anyway, sponsors. Sponsor. Our How's our man Tage? Tage? Yeah. Yeah. Project Warpath. <laughs> as always, they take care of us. We try to take care of them. Please check them out at ProjectWarpath.com. And on Instagram for as long as it lasts uh, with shadow banning and outright, you know, deplatforming. But as far as I know, they're still on there and we will have Tage on soon. We're yep. very excited about that. There's a lot yep. of good things in the works and he's a, an old teammate of mine. So it's always a hoot to go down memory lane, especially if you guys think I'm crazy. Okay. Imagine someone twice as big, twice as crazy as me. That's Tage and it, I love him for it. It must have been a team of <laughs> five vibe. Right. It was the team five vibe was very special. <laughs> very special. Special like short bus special? No, as in there was a level of like violence or aggression. <laughs> I remember a quick story, and I might have told it on another podcast, but we would in buds jog past all the different teams' compounds going to chow on the other side of the, the street there at the amphibious base. And man, when you walk by Team Five's little chain link fence, dude, it was like, what the fuck is behind? It, it kind of segues into the guy we're gonna talk to. I was like, hey, what is it? Prison rules in that fuck? Like they, they're just screaming bloody murder and throwing shit over the like. It was like you walk past the, uh, a yard of poodles. You walk past the yard of chihuahuas. And then you walk past some fucking pit bulls, dude. It was that fence was shaking, and you were like, "God damn, what, what, what team is that?" We'd whisper because we don't want to, you know, that's Team Five. Like, oh fuck, I don't want to go there. I was kind of like, I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were like Delta House out of Animal House. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, is this the Delta House? Sure. Come on in. 
We were, we absolutely. Were Delta oh my it. god. 100%, 100%. I love it. Oh, cool. hey, real quick too. Yeah. Um a couple little items before we dive into our guest. One, I got a Garmin smartwatch. Ooh. And I realized you have to be smart to actually wear a smartwatch. I have no idea how it works. That's just the first screen that popped up. We're looks, good. Call it even. Great. It gives me my uh, heart rate, altitude, temperature, steps, calories, and oh, my battery's at 95%. <laughs> and I every time I touch a button, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> what do I do? I back to the thing. So for anyone that's curious about a smartwatch, please take it from me, Captain Dum Dum. You got to be smart to wear a smartwatch. Just stick Super to a G-Shock. Smart. Trust me, get your little fifty dollar G Shock at Walmart and be yep, happy. Exactly. Speaking that, of the G, right? Dude, that's it. Oh, that's a nice looking. That's a G Shock. This is no. This is a uh, from that. That's a uh, smartwatch. Isn't this it? is a. Uh, well, uh, you're smart though. You got something that talks to NASA. I'm sure. I'm being a, a moron right now, but it's. Is uh, it the Snowden model? Is it? <laughs> this is the. Uh, God, I I feel terrible right now. Rockwell Time. Oh those, yeah. Those oh, guys. those are good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. those are. They look like fancy smart watches but they're like g-shocks dude they're yeah, just they're good yeah. i like rockwell i haven't and, i had a couple of those and i think he's a i i think he's a vet so it's a supporting vet but i i don't want to say for sure but. yeah there's something i i came across their watches through uh maybe palling around with tank or something they are connected somehow to the veteran community yeah but no. i did i yeah tank sent me one and yeah i loved it it's good. a good watch, but it is more of a G st- a G Shock style than it is a smartwatch, Dude, which I, is nice. It's rugged. It's simple. It tells you the time. What else exactly. do you need a watch to do? I need <laughs> just tell me what day it is, what time it is. Have a stopwatch in case you could need to time me on my beer run. Um, yeah, right? that's it. A stopwatch. <laughs> Dude, I was in there taking a whiz before the show here, and my little watch vibrated, and it said, "Oh, Ryan, you an email." I'm like, "Why does my watch have to tell me this?" Like, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. It tells me the alarms if the side door is open, like the wife will go out the side with the dog and it vibrates. And I'm like, how do I why does it keep vibrating? Maybe I should put it somewhere else if it's going to vibrate this much. Exactly. Just a thought. Nope, I, I'm it's, with it's, you. It's like a little tiny wrist. That's all I'm saying. And oh, th- I looked at our map, too, real quick before I forget. Okay. Lebanon. What? Awesome. And I'm super pumped about this. Falkland Islands is tuning in. That's what I was saying last time. There's those islands. I know crazy. Yeah, right? Falklands Island. There was like a big war there with the British and the SAS. Dude. That's you know, crazy. The Falkland Islands. I'm like, damn. You know what? It, it could be some of the, the British secret scrolls uh, still over there. That's what I'm saying. I yeah. didn't even know there was anything on the Falkland Islands, really. I thought it was just strategic. It was close to you know certain countries in uh, South America. I it, didn't know. Like, I guess people live it's on It's an island. outpost in the jungle. He's got a coconut radio <laughs> listening to us. It does. <laughs> Freedom Radio. Tune yeah. in, baby. Well, hello. Welcome, everybody, islands. Vibe Tribe. Yeah. Welcome. Every, everybody's welcome. We love it. I continue to see, uh, you know, our numbers grow in these countries. It's truly amazing. We love all you guys, whether you're secret squirrels in bad places or just cool local people that think we're funny. <laughs> we love we love everybody. We do. But uh, yeah, on that note, let's bring in our guest. Um, we're going to bring in um, Mr. Ed. <laughs> All right, Mr. Ed. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Ed. Here we I go. I love it. <laughs> and it works. Hey. Eddie, what's up? What's up, gentlemen? <laughs> here. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, welcome, welcome to the show, brother. I want our guests to know that you've been our secret Santa for a long time. You're kind of a Metallica always talks about the fifth member of the band. Well, you've you've been the third member of this band for yes. quite a while. And I wanted to bring you on and thank you for it. You've definitely been kind to our show and helped us out a lot in the past. So first and foremost, thank you for that, Eddie. You're Very awesome. Much. I greatly appreciate it, man. Yep. You're most yep. welcome. In fact, I just added uh, you guys to my website as far as, um, as, far as podcast affiliations. Oh, so nice. you can throw it on there. So anybody that jumps on that page will see your page as well. Yeah, what's, what's your uh, what's your what's website? It, yeah. Go ahead and throw it out there. Uh, my, uh, you know what? I'm lucky enough to get my name. It's EddieMolina.com. Nice. Yeah, you didn't have to do lucky. a weird variation like Eddie Molina 69 or something crazy. You actually got your name. <laughs> yeah, I was lucky. You know what? When I was in Iraq, um, I Googled my name for some reason out of nowhere. And it came up as EddieMolina.com. And I clicked on it. And it was a tattoo artist from New York City. So I emailed uh-huh. him from my Iraq web email. <laughs> like, hey, you know <laughs> just wanted to say hi we have the same name and he's like hey if you ever come down i'll give you a free tattoo 
Really? I never, I never followed up with that though. Unfortunately. Oh shit! That's oh, man, cool. some free ink. I'd be all about it. About it. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I was scared to get it because I, I didn't want because it's permanent. You know, so, um, you know, it's not that I turned it down. I was like, I'm not ready for one. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. And and in fact, I just got my first one uh, a few months ago. Nice. Oh, nice. I'm 42 years old. And I just got my first one. <laughs> hey, hey, never, never too late, man. Yeah. Was it, yeah. Was it Taz? What's that? <laughs> was it Taz? Has no, 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 it's a dolphin on my hip. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, there you go. sweet. <laughs> no, my you know first what? I, was a tramp stamp. I got a unicorn on my lower back. It's pretty dope. Yeah, I, I thought of it too. I'm like, oh, that's not a bad idea. But I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Dude. so who is Eddie? Tell, tell our audience, you know, who you are, what you, what you've done. Um, yeah, where'd you I, grow up? Where you kind of born? What was your childhood like? You know, besides you know being into unicorns and dolphins as a kid, what did you do? You know, how did you kind of progress through your life? Well, uh, I think I led a pretty normal childhood. We were fortunate where we we lived next to a park, um, and our our fence backed up to this park, so this park was like our headquarters. That's where we spent uh, all day nice. every day. Yep. So fast forward now, uh, when my wife and I were looking for a home, we're like, we need a big yard. We need somewhere where these kids <laughs> play. They're not going to be on computers. You're going to be outside all day because that's what I grew up. Amen. And that was back then where, you know, you didn't need supervision. You didn't need to be home at a certain hour other than. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what part was, of the country did you grow up in? New Jersey, central New Jersey. Oh, yeah. nice. Okay. Yeah. it's I like the state geographically because you have uh skiing and winter stuff and then you also have the beach summer stuff so you, you have there both you, you have the city new york city what we call it the city yeah half hour away um it's just the the extremes of the weather can get annoying because it, it was 70 degrees two days ago and it's supposed <laughs> to go on tuesday <laughs> <laughs> Shit. that'd be a fun place to grow up though man i mean you had a lot of options like you said Go skiing, or you just go into the city and goof around, or you yeah. weren't one of them Jersey Shore dudes, I assume, though. Uh, I was. <laughs> I was um, I there was you very... go. Please email us a, a picture of the Jersey Shore days. We'll make sure we add it to the podcast on YouTube. <laughs> I will. You know, one of the main bars is called Bar A, and anyone from New Jersey knows that. Uh, Bar A and DJs. Those are the biggest meathead. It's like the capital of the country was this place called. Uh... <laughs> Is it sponsored it. by Jaeger bombs? Yeah, and uh, I remember screaming like Jaeger bombs, you know. Just that guy. I was very much that guy, and and you know what's funny? Like that Jersey Shore show was so hilarious and entertaining, but you literally could go to any of these shore towns and pick out six people and just make a document and make like the same. Thing. Oh, I like, bet same oh, formula, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I tried watching that Florida Bama house or whatever. It's like the the Florida version of Jersey Shore. I was like, there, there's nothing. Yeah, it's not the same flavor, man. There's... Yeah, they're just crazy here, man. And and I like to think I kind of outgrew it because I still have friends that still do that in their forties. Jaeger bomb. <laughs> yeah, I, I was very much a meathead, and uh, yeah. <laughs> so okay, so you took some of this this meathead uh, persona, and uh -huh. you know what what took the meathead into law enforcement then well wait, wait, hold on a second don't skip too far ahead what no? did you do after because you got into <laughs> some overseas stuff oh and... that's right yeah I joined yeah. The so, guard, um... so when you left the jersey shore <laughs> you joined I, the guard I, I did both because I, I i liked it so much my brother went active duty in the 90s late 90s and i went to go see him down at uh, fort stewart in savannah and i was like man this is pretty cool i kind of like this lifestyle but I didn't want to leave Jersey at the same time. And then I, and I was delivering pizza at the time and I kept hearing the same national guard commercial on the, the radio station. Oh yeah. I'm like, you know what? That's somewhere in between a good compromise. I can get involved in the army and I can still be at home. I think Polly Shore made a movie about that. <laughs> yeah. The army now. <laughs> lumped into that category, but yeah. <laughs> the, the water, water boy. <laughs> so that's, that's what I did. I did that for a few years. I, I was actually a pretty shitty soldier. Cause, uh, I, I like partying too much. Um, so I miss so many drills. Uh, this is pre 9 11. Like, I you feel you, brother. I was in the same boat, man. I was, that's why I made a, a shirt that said, re not ready for war, ready for rehab. That was my whole team. We were just party animals. So I feel you, man. <laughs> yeah. So I missed a lot of drills and, and pre 9 11 days, like they just eventually push you out. Like, all right, you're just, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I went back around 2004 because I was like, that's all I'm doing is partying. I'm not getting anywhere. I was still working and doing okay, but I wasn't getting anywhere. 
So I'm like, let me go back to the NASCAR. Let me do it right the second time. Let me go back <laughs> to the school, uh, you know, finish it. And then um, a buddy of mine who I met in the guard, he's like, why don't you take the test and, you know, go into corrections. And that's what I did. That's where I Oh, up. nice. Okay. Yeah. So oh, that's wow. what led into it. And how long, uh, when did you get into corrections? Around that time frame? You've been in it for quite a while, right? Oh, seven, I started. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't nice. bad. Um, you know, it hit, it hit the bullet points as far as, you know, making a living. Um, <clears throat> at the time, I deployed in 2008. Uh, so I wasn't there long before I went overseas. And um, when I came back, I went back to school, you know, because I had the GI Bill now maximizing that. And I was on the midnight shift. So I'm like, you know, I have to write a lot of papers. Might as well do it on the third shift because what the hell else are you doing? I'm not going to Yeah, sleep. everyone's sleeping, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and that's how I got into writing because I, I ran into this magazine, you know, a local one, and uh, they were looking for content. I'm like, everything I'm writing is work-related, so I'll just give you whatever you want. Hmm. And that's how it started. And that was the Blue Magazine, which I still work, well, I don't work for them, but I, you know, I work with them. And work so. with them. Yeah, nice. What was your first day in prison like? <laughs> Luckily, it was in uniform, so <laughs> that's the, the yeah. best version of your first day in prison. But still, it's got to be your first day. Like, that experience has to be weird. Like, I've always dreaded, like, I don't want to mess up where I end up in that situation. And even as, you know, a, a corrections guy, it's still like your first day has got to be weird, man. What was that like? Uh, it was a Saturday. I remember, like, it was yesterday. Um, I was in the visit program you know because back then when you're a rookie you don't have a assigned job so wherever they need you just plug you and visits so obviously one of the worst ones and I'm like all right well you're working there and I, I remember walking in and going to like the central area and i'm like i don't even know where i'm like i know where the gym is i'm not even i had to pull out my rookie map i'm like all right the gym is down the hallway <laughs> oh <laughs> no <laughs> yeah and and they give me like 10 radios and about a thousand keys i'm like here take this to the gym and i'm like shit so i i couldn't even get to my map <laughs> But, you know, I found my made my way there and, you know, everyone's standing there. I'm like, all right, great. I'm not the only one going to be working here. And then uh, they just walked me through it. You know, they were, the expectations were low. They're like, all right, this is your first day. There was no training in the visit program because that's a weekend thing. And we only did training during the week. Mm. They just kind of like just stand to the side, just follow us. And, you know, we just went through the day. Was now, it a little intimidating? Did you feel a little overwhelmed? I mean, I, I think most jobs – at first, it's maybe not that you're scared, but you just don't know what's going on. Like, I, I felt that when I was brand new to law enforcement, it was just so confusing. Everyone seemed to be in this rhythm and they knew how to respond to stuff. And I remember just kind of standing there like not sure what I should do. It's kind of weird. You know, was that similar for you? Yeah. And, and it's funny because at the time, like I thought I knew what I was doing, but you don't know. To, you don't know. And at some point you realize that you don't know. And um. You know, I just remember being there and now, you know, fast forward a few years now, every few months you get a new cycle of rookies and you can just tell they have the same behaviors. They're like, oh, I, I got this, but you don't know. And then they make mistakes and then you are taking the funk. Yeah, they're just pretending they know. Yeah. yeah. And I, I later learned down the road. I'm like, just be honest. Like, it's OK yeah. not to say you don't know. It's fine. You know, In a don't, weird don't... way, there's probably a lot of similarity between the that new officer and the new guy coming in as a prisoner. You know, I mean, there's yeah. just that fear of the unknown. I mean, yes, there's different oh, things yeah. you're going to experience, obviously being an officer and an inmate, but it's that first day of, holy shit, I, I don't know what this world's like. You know, did you observe that after you, you know, were on the job for months or a year where you saw that same type of, you know, lack of a better word, fear from the new guy starting as an officer and then also the new guy coming in day one? Uh, yeah, you, you see I don't even want to call it fear um, and it's not even lost because you do do two weeks of on the job training where uh, they pair you up with a regular officer and like, all right, uh, stay attached to the hip of this guy for the next few hours and then go here and do that for the next few hours. So you're not walking in completely blind. Um, and then it, within that two week period, you start to learn, you know, which officers are going to be like, all right, come with me. I'll, I'll show you what to do. And which ones are going to be like, go fuck off. Like here's the keys, leave me alone. And then you just kind of gravitate towards the one you know that would be more helpful. And then your questions in the beginning sound stupid, but it's because you just have no idea. Like, where is the chow hall? And it's like, I forgot, I'm lost. And it sounds so stupid. But, yeah. You don't no, know, you don't know. It, well, it, I bet you then observed uh, on the other side where there's that big guy that goes, the new guy goes, you have to be attached to my hip. 
So, <laughs> and, and, you know, there's there's categories. There's the bullies. There's the pranksters. We had this one dude. Ooh. He was an old head. Um, that's what we called the old veterans, the salty veterans. He was ready to retire, and he would give us. He tried this on me. He would give us a list, and he's like, "Hey, go down the the tier and go ask the inmates who wants to go to the pool." Which there is no pool. <laughs> I love it. I would that be is that guy. So mean. And he would get people, you know, he'd come back with the names, like, all right. And then he would walk them back and be like, hey, go in this side of the cell and uh, just go inspect something. And as they walk in, he would slam the door shut and let them sit there for a while. He's like, you never go inside a cell. Like, that was his way of teaching, like, that hard. Yeah. Like, oh. But by then, you know, I already heard these stories. I'm like, all right, just be able to be, watch out for this guy. That's yeah. Awesome. After after a couple times, you're like, oh, okay, fuckers. Yeah, yeah. I, I was get it. Where there was enough uh, guys that barely squeaked by the academy, where they were getting all the attention, like the the goofballs of the class. Like I, I was by this time, I already had some military experience. You know, I just got off, um, or I was just training. You know, plenty of time, so I, I was confident. You know, I was sure of myself. And then there's other guys who just they couldn't. They had two left feet, and like they're the ones that are getting all the sh- the lion's share of the attention, the negative attention, anyway. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I that. bet. How long until you saw like your first oh shit moment working for um, the prison? The first couple of months, um, there wow. was one unit. They shut this jail down actually years later, uh, but they had like a barrack style unit where it was just one large room with beds. And towards the end, there were bunk beds. And then there was a, a, a communal shower. You know, there'd be like four shower heads, one big room. Mm-mm. And they jump. I don't know what the story behind it because was my first couple months, so I don't understand the politics. I don't understand the culture of prison yet. Yeah, uh, they jumped this one dude, and the weapon of choice was a lock and a sock. You know, they issued locks and put it in a sock, and it makes a great. Yeah. Um, so if, if you find an inmate with a lock in a sock, they're getting charged with a weapon, even though they're allowed to have both. You just can't put them together. Yeah. And uh, they did this to this one dude. They they took a chunk out of his head. Wow. And, you know, you just see like blood, I guess they're blood clots. I don't know what they are, but they just see chunks. It wasn't his brain. It was just blood clots all over the floor and he was passed out. Uh, they had to medevac him out, but I'm mm. sure you notice more than, more than most. The helicopter, you know, the guards are big dudes sometimes. And we had problems finding an officer that met the weight requirements. So they <laughs> took about an hour, oh, shit. Took an hour to, to find the right person. That's wow. the right size. To get <laughs> weapon and by the time they took off I'm like, you could have been back and forth three times to the hospital by the time they, they actually took off with this dude See, i would just hire a skinny dude and say you got one job here bro you're gonna sit in the office until the helicopter comes <laughs> <laughs> get a little 130 pound dude <laughs> yeah they had to go relieve this one girl from this one area you know she had to go get the weapon like it just took forever oh, the guy ended up surviving but uh he was never the same after. wow now, do they, you know, I have one buddy, we briefly talked about this, one of my high school buddies, he works for state prison system in Colorado, I guess, out in Lyman, Colorado. And uh, and I think most people know this, but I've always been curious, was the system that you worked for, do they segregate themselves or do does the system segregate them according to race or was it mixed in or... It just seems to be a lot of prison documentaries I've seen or whatever, you know, white dudes over here, black dudes over here, Hispanic dudes over here. Is that kind of how your facility was set up? Or does that happen naturally? Is it, do the, the guards place them in that way just to, it keeps the peace a little easier or why is that kind of a thing? Um, the classification department finds the housing. Uh, they don't segregate them by race, but there is often a commonality. Um, one of the main jails I worked at, this is when I was a sergeant, it was one of the bigger jails in the state, um, one of the more active ones. This is where I learned 99% of my knowledge. Um, they had it where these two units, if, if if you have a typical crime, you're going to this unit to start. Oh, gotcha. But it ended up being a lot of like thugs and knuckleheads. And if you're a little bit older, you're going to be on this half of the building. Um, so it was, but it had nothing to do with race. It was just just this way if you're new you're going to start this side if you're kind of oh, old, okay kind of like a weird so was each facility a little different then it's up to the administration to say hey we're going to have violent criminals here older dudes over here like what's the because i've always worried like I'm, I'm almost turning 48 and i thought man if i fuck up now and end up in prison i'm gonna have some 25 year old just mop the floor with me man like <laughs> what's the age cut off where i'm just hanging out with other old people so i know how much longer i need to behave <laughs> playing dominoes 
<laughs> yeah, when you, when you first get in there, they, they classify you. You get it goes by a point system where they look at the type of crime, they look at your history, both inside the prison and outside, um, and they make make a determination. But they're all considered general population, so you could go anywhere. Fuck. But it just happens over time that it evolves. It's like, all right, well, so I'm gonna yeah. take an ass whoop in the first couple of weeks, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this is kind of where the system. <laughs> Till the guards feel sorry for me, put them with the old people. This guy can't fight. <laughs> that happens sometimes. They 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 do for move... protection, remove people. Yeah, they're targeted and stuff. Well, not just that, but punitive. Like, hey, you're an asshole. We're gonna move you to. Oh, we know you're not gonna be okay in. Yeah. It works both ways, and I've seen some inmates. And one of the things that I got into was uh, snitches. They were gold because they would tell you everything. And um, you know, once I found out, like an inmate's in distress somehow, like he's just not getting along. They're kind of bullying him. I'm like, you know, come with me. I can help you. You know, but you have uh, to uh, give you some info and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if they don't want to, which I respect, you know, it's it is prison. You know, it's a very sensitive thing. If you don't want to help, that's fine. I can't help you if you're not going to help me. Um, but I do see guys. I'm like, they're not going to survive. Like this guy's fuck. Either got high and he committed a crime. He's just not built for this environment. And yeah, uh, it it starts a cycle where it's like, all right, well, if they're going to bully you at some point, you're going to, you know, either check in, which means I want to hurt myself, go to lock up or something, or refuse to lock in, say I can't do this anymore. But then that that comes with punishment. Yeah, so now, that guy who can't make it on this unit. And now he's going into the disciplinary system. And then eventually he'll go into more of a, a punitive unit where it's like, all right, now you're dealing with other inmates who have mental health problems where it's even more dangerous. I bet. Yeah. There's really nothing you could do about it. Um, I've had a few where, you know, once I had a reputation, I'm like, all right, they can trust me in a sense. They can tell me things and I'm not going to botch it. I'm not just going to go run off and, t you know, run after every lead they're giving me. <laughs> You know, Yo, do. Tommy just told me you guys are stuffing shit in your buttholes. Yeah. Well, you know that's literally how it goes down. <laughs> and we got to go get it. Yeah. Yeah. They'll let you know. Yeah. Right, but yeah. sometimes you have to, you know, like with intelligence, sometimes you have to let it sit. Yeah, exactly. Well, especially you want to catch maybe a bigger fish or find out, okay, I know dude's got it, but I need to figure out how exactly he's getting it or something like that. Yeah. You don't want to blow it right when you get it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, and when I when I got more evolved in the intelligence game, it was like that. I'm like, all right, I know this guy's got it. I know this guy's a junkie. And then I started letting the junkies go. I'm like, I'm not gonna right play charges for this guy who has one hit. Yeah, trying to get a quick high. Um, sometimes I'll use that against him. I'm like, listen, I can. Yeah, know, put someone in your shoes. Yeah, where'd you get this? We used to work people up because. Like you, why are we going to hit the street level, guys? We want to figure out where it's coming from. What house is this coming from? And then we hit the house and figure out how they're getting, you know, re-upped and things like that. So I'm sure it's the same game. It's just in a in an ecosystem. Well, like, speaking what, of what's the, the most creative way you saw like yeah. shit coming in? What's the what's the weirdest item? I think a lot of people obviously drugs and things like that. But did you ever see like a 1980 cell phone smuggled in someone's butt or like what what really surprised you? Like, what the hell? You know, um, in training, they had uh, in the chapel, they had um, it was a wooden cross that was okay. hanging. On, that was no. there. Yeah. And when you pull it off, like you pull the, the top part out and it's actually a weapon. Oh, it was like a sword or a shank or something. It was a shank, yeah, and it was just fashion. And then, like they would just put it back and hang it up, but it was just it was a just in case. Uh, yeah, for years. Well, I I wanted to ask because again, it what's always impressed me on the documentaries I've seen is is when you have nothing but time in your hands, the creativity and the resourcefulness oh, that these smart, these yeah. inmates develop. It's like. You can't even believe they came up with that. How shit. they communicate, how they plan, yeah, organize. So it is amazing. Can can you tell us and tell the audience, like, tell us some of the things you observed that just were you just like, how the fuck did they think of that? <laughs> yeah, you know what? There's so many like small examples. Um, they had their own universe, really. And this is what I used to tell all the recruits. I'm like, they're in their own universe. They have their own hierarchy. You know, you have your junkies, dealers, kingpins. Um, most people just want to get through the day. They're not interested in all that. Um, but they would leave notes somewhere that means nothing to us. Like, all right, this is just symbols. Like we would take and confiscate it. And sometimes we would figure out what they're talking about. But that's one way they would communicate. Because if they're all going, if one unit's going to the gym, they would leave notes somewhere. Mm. The next unit, they would know where to go to get it. Uh, that's one way they communicate. Um, 
the kitchen's like a a, a, a a really critical spot in any prison, really, because that's where information, that's where people are going in and out. So that's usually the hub of any institution as far as not just moving contraband, but moving information. Wow. Yeah. Um, another good one was Suboxone. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It, it looks like a Listerine strip. It's really meant for people who have heroin addiction. It, it's basically a narcotic, but it's, it's really powerful. Um, but it looks like a Listerine strip, so it's 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 flat and it's hard to pick up on. Mm. There and it's still going on to this day where the legal mail you can't search legal mail traditionally. You can't like go through each read. You can't read it. Really? Like, yeah, you can't go through that because it's legal. Oh, so the shit. most you can do is you have to open it up in the presence of, of an officer and like kind of flip through the top part of the pages. You know, when you go like this, and then and then you just give it to them and they sign off on it. Mm -hmm. But one of the ways that they get drugs in is those suboxone strips because they're real flat. They'll take, I well, got pieces of paper. Well, they'll take two papers, put glue on the edge of the paper, and then line wow. up the paper with the suboxone strip, take another piece, and basically cake it. So now you have one piece of paper that it's really two glued together. Wow. And they'll just squeeze that inside, you know, with 100 other legal mails that's coming from a fake legal address. Yeah. And, and, and what's that, the going rate for those strips in, inside? For a um, strip yeah if it's if it's like the strong uh the strong one they'll cut each strip out and it's literally about the size of a listerine strip they'll cut it into eight parts wow. you know, like half to kind of half again and one hit which you get eight hits from one strip is 10 bucks so that's Whoa, what's it do to you what is this is it jack you up or is it is it a downer is it an upper uh it just mellows you out it's just like any other painkiller it's just another oh, gotcha like, okay no, okay but, really meant to come off the opiate addiction oh i got you more control it's, it it gives you the same feeling without the uh getting hooked that heroin does the heroin makes you hooked is it's, that the most common kind of drug is the kind of the downers because people want to chill out and escape the problems like people aren't smuggling and blow and getting all amped up is it more common to see the downers um they don't majority of, of these drug addicts they don't put that much thought they just want to whatever alter. Yeah, and the boxing is so popular because, you know, if you get a hundred strips in one envelope, which is very possible, now oh, you do wow. that and it's going everywhere. Yeah. Um, the other one that's popular is K two, and that that's that's synthetic marijuana, and that's everywhere too, and that's that comes in through the visit program, which is another story I'll tell you. Uh, is that, that what chicks are smuggling stuff in their cooters? Wait. Absolutely. <laughs> Holy so wait, let, let me let me get this straight. Your a hundred strips will come in. Out of the strips, out of a hundred, they could they could cut it into eight, which is roughly eight hundred individual strips, selling at about ten bucks. That's eight thousand dollars a dude's making. Where right. the hell are they hiding eight thousand dollars in cash from you guys? Like honestly, um, everything has a value. This cup of soup is 50 cents or, you know, this, this bottle of water, you know, cause they get to order stuff from the canteen. So it's not just actual money. There's no, there's not too much real money floating around, but everything has money. Everything has a value to it. So as long as you're paying $10 worth of whatever, then you're going to get it. So someone mm. basically has a book like of markers, like, okay, you owe me this. Absolutely. Yep. That and is how a lot of people get jammed up is cause they'll go into debt. And and then they'll check mm -hmm. in, you know, they, they'll be, they'll build so much debt, and then like, oh, I gotta, they'll either turn snitch or they'll say I gotta lock in. I'm not, I'm, re I'm, I'm refusing to lock in so that I can go to lockup, get in trouble. But usually, uh -huh. if you lock in, it's it's a minor charge, it's a slap on the wrist if it's your first or second offense. Um, and then they'll just send you back, and then you'll start somewhere else. And then they might intervene. Uh, IA might intervene if they know that this guy owes money. And sometimes I would do that too. I'm like. I know you don't want to lock in because you owe somebody money. I can help you, but you gotta help me. And it starts that 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 game starts. So you're you I mean, you're in the East Coast, you said Jersey. Um, obviously all throughout the United States, different uh different gangs control the the system. Where you're at, is it more of, you know, MCs, hardcore gangs, uh Aryan Brotherhood? Who who runs the system out of Jersey? Um, Bloods is big in New Jersey. Um, MS-13 is pretty big. They're, they're more wild. Um, Latin Kings are big. I would say as far as in terms of numbers, the Bloods are by far 
the most in, in numbers across the state. Um, but Latin Kings are up there too. And, and they each operate independently for the most part, but they will work together for the sake of a business and mm. everything in the oh, prison shit. is all about money. So, you know, in the old days, a lot of people would think like, all right, well, if, you know, if a blood runs into a crypt, they got to fight. Like it doesn't work like that. Like if this one crypt can provide a service where, Hey, I got a source on the outside who's willing to bring it in through the visits. And there's a network of these blood members. They're going to say, all right, well, we'll let's work together. Cause you know, everything's about money in jail. So the, wow. So it's its own little ecosystem, <clears throat> excuse me, separate from the streets. Then a lot of that stuff. Do you see that amongst like the, will the Aryan brotherhood work with MS 13 or if there's money involved, it's, it's Absolutely. yeah, really, that's crazy. Yeah. Cause from the outside, you always think, Oh, there's all these race wars and gang wars. And, but it makes sense that they're in this little bubble and if they can work together and make money, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's money that fuels everything. Um, that's what, makes prison system work and it, that is more important so the violence isn't as bad as people think either because they know that violence is bad for business um, gotcha. sometimes they will say hey you're you're a nobody foot soldier go interrupt this enterprise by going after this guy so that'll bring you know them but it's 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 financially related though it's not right. just turf wars it's it's hey go fuck with their business because they're stepping on our shit or something that and that's i used to tell people about the cartels in arizona is they're they're not violent very often stateside because they're dealing with billions of dollars i mean if if you kill a cop and you're a sinaloa cartel guy that's bad for business you're going to put that enterprise on the radar of multiple levels of law enforcement same with the hell's angels there were lots of chapters within phoenix and people would ask me did they ever fuck with you guys i'm like no they don't ride around like it's the 70s you know all bar brawling and they're a business i mean they want to make money and so they're very low profile and so it makes sense what you're saying you know it's why would you you know i don't know the level of money that they're doing but i'm sure it's significant and it has ties to the outside i'm sure there's a lot of money on the outside related to what's on the inside you know what i mean so it's if they fuck that up they're going to have to deal with people on the outside if and when they ever well, get out there. That's kind of fascinating because when did you, I guess, witness or maybe inform us when that transition? Because a lot of the documentaries you see there on history or discovery, I mean, they're filmed back in like early 90s, you know, San Quentin, things like that. And again, it, it, it's more of a perspective of race and, you know, they're staying in your side of the yard, we're fighting and all over this. But you're saying that it, it's kind of uh, grown into like, Dude, that's Business. petty shit. Let's all <laughs> yeah. figure out how to make money, and yeah. that's the name of the game. So, w- if that's true, when did you kind of witness that transition of them finally figuring out that that's probably smarter? Yeah, my um, I didn't actually witness the transition because uh, you know in 07, when I was a rookie, I assumed that there was a complicated st- uh, system where they say, all right, if you're in this gang, you have to go here. If you're in that gang, you have to go there. Yeah. Um, it's actually dangerous because when you have too many of the same ones in one spot, they kind of feed off each other. So they purposely mm. do that. They purposely uh-huh. make them up. Um, and they have tried that in the state. They tried that years ago where they decided to put, uh, and I wrote this in my book, they decided to put um, <clears throat> all of the leaders in one institution in one specific unit thinking that, hey, if we can get them together, we'll rehabilitate ah. rehab- right just put all the brains of the operation in one room yeah it's not it's, good it's, yeah. now the, it's called the boardroom <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, like, now they're they coming thought, up with great ideas yeah. yeah and they thought that they would just like feed off each other this positivity and then from there it'll keep it down and everything fix everything i'm like you know and, and oh, now, yeah, this is before i got to this institution so <laughs> i'm now second hand um, but it just turned into problems every day. They're sure. fighting. Um, they're not necessarily yeah. they're refusing to cooperate, which means now we got to go get them. Yeah, they're out now. The other guy wants to act up, and the next thing you know, it's just you know that that lasted. I want to say three or four months before they said, "All right, it's not working. Let's sprinkle them back into the community and just go." I bet they're always trying to tweak the formula, right, to see like what keeps the most peace on a day to day basis. I would imagine that you know there's got to be somebody some administrator someone that evaluates that and says hey why don't we try this or i mean i've always had a question well a couple quick questions but one question is the facilities you've worked at like what opportunities do these guys have you always hear 
rumors that they have access to like online college or they can finish their high school degree, um, learning languages. I mean, I guess it depends on the facility and then the type of programs they have. But do, from your experience, was there anything like that, that if you were a trustee or a, a well-behaved inmate and you were in there for whatever reason, let's say you got five years, could you do something that would kind of prepare you to be re-released into society? Yeah, there, there's been a big push since I started, I would say more in the last seven or eight years of rehabilitative programs. Um, there's colleges now that they offer free college classes to some guys and you know, they're not all bad guys. They made mistakes. Um, well, we are what, only thing that we care about is, are they good for us here? Sure. How we define it. Um, so a lot of them do take advantage of it and those programs are there and they do help. And then there's the manipulation part of it where, one guy's like, all right, well, I know my buddy is in this unit. He's a, a, a resource to my network. If I meet him in this class, we can do uh, business. Of Great. course, someone's gaming it, yeah. Yeah, and you know, so that. But Dude, you if I was a shot caller, I'd be like, all right, listen, okay, you go take the marketing class. You take the logistics <laughs> class. You take the accounting class. Let's 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 become the you know the the well, apple. Yeah. Someone's <laughs> always got the business angle on it. Like, exactly. yeah, how can I? Well, yeah. yeah, and there's you know, some of them are are just not that smart and just like, yeah, they're not just not bright people. And then there's other ones that are intelligent. So you really could have done anything you wanted in life, but you chose this. Yeah, that's true. They, Some that people, yeah. they would have been a good businessman, but they decided to be a criminal and organized shit. What about the average Joe that doesn't want to get involved? You know, let's say I got hammered and ended up, uh, you know, accidentally killing people in a DUI. So I'm not a bad guy. Just whatever. I was just I did something stupid. Kind of like you said, a lot of these guys probably just made a stupid mistake. Mm -hmm. Now they have to do some time. Would there be a way for someone like me to kind of avoid trouble? like not join a gang or how do you kind of remain the gray man and not get sucked into, Hey, come work for us type of deal. Is that possible? Or how would you survive if you're a regular dude going in? Uh, there is some tact to it. Um, it. It's tough. And some guys I see, and those are the ones I was targeting. I'm like, you clearly don't fit in. Uh, let me help you kind of come to the dark side almost. Mm. Uh, but I know that they're not going to make it on their own. But if you, act a certain way if you conduct yourself a way if you have if you look like you have confidence then they tend to like all right this guy will leave him alone kind of thing but if you look petrified you look terrified then we're gonna you know come after you in 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 um in a sense where if you're gonna be here you better pay us like we're allowing you to stay here so you better come up with whatever get somebody on the street to get money send you money buy some stuff and your monthly rent is gonna be here if you don't want any problems and some some do that some survive that way um, and some others hold their own where they're like, you're not going to push me around kind of thing. And, and, and if you're a sophisticated network, that's making money, you don't want to jeopardize it. You're like, all right, you just leave you know some people alone. Yeah. Yeah. Like these ain't worth it. And, and that's where the skill part comes in. You know, if they can manage to hold their own without having to get violent, then, you know, the kind of bounces out there, but it's, it's the weak ones they target because then they want to extort them for money. Wow. Sure. Nice. Well, I had a, a buddy in the teams that ended up, uh, he got in a bar fight, fucked up this dude pretty good. And it was weird. He had to go, uh, I don't know if it was jail or prison, but wherever he went, he had to go for a year and they put him on work release back to the command. And so our team did the best they could to give him like extra duty to keep him around the team area. He couldn't leave the compound, but they'd put him on, you know, different type of assignments and but he said, we'd always ask him, like, dude, what's it like, man? He goes, it's really weird, but the main dude likes me. And the reason why is he thinks his dad was a SEAL. He goes, I know he's full of shit, but he keeps everyone off my back. <laughs> so this dude will come in my cell and just talk for fucking hours. But wow. by me being cool with him and then everyone else knows, like, hey, don't fuck with this dude and this and that. But he was able to kind of, like you said, just be away from it but it was i think they respected kind of who he was and what he was doing and he was kind of a gnarly dude like he he wasn't a pussy like anyone would know if we're gonna fuck with this guy like it's it's not gonna be a freebie but he had to befriend the, the main dude who was nuts and chew up yeah. a lot of his time so you know i guess in that situation he got lucky because i've always tried to put myself in those situations like fuck what would i do what would i do i'm a former cop what about a former law enforcement that ended up in there is it true they put you in isolation or do they just say hey sorry dude you're 
Uh, it depends the on rest the rest of them. Um, it depends on the case. There is an institution where they have guys like that. They were former cops, judges, you know, things of that nature. Yeah. They, together, but that's not a guarantee. Like they could go other places. In the one institution I was at, we had an ex corrections officer who was charged with um, sex offender crimes. Mm. Yeah. Oh, we knew who he was. We didn't know him personally because you know it's a big, big uh, network. Um, but we knew the guy's deal. But he just minded his own business and and he, he did fine. Um, so the other inmates know? didn't know. I don't know. No don't... tango and cash scenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know the uh, the extent of it. Um, this is right before I left this one institution, so I didn't. I was you know pulling away from because uh, I was going to make rank, so I started to take other people in. As far as, hey, if you want to get into the, involved in this intelligence networking and snitches and that whole thing, like this is a perfect example. So I started training other guys. I'm like, this is the question you have to ask. There's a way you have to ask them. You have to know when to stop asking and when to pull away. And, you know, it's an art form. Mm-hmm. An art form. So I don't know how much they got into that guy as far as I know one person spoke to him. Like, hey, you know, we know your situation. If there's any information you want to tell us, we can help you get along better. And he was willing to play ball. I just don't know what extent that particular guy. I would have told him, bro, I'm about to get on the PA system and tell everyone you're a fucking pig. So you better snitch. <laughs> there is a bad cop running. There is, you can do that. Uh, I've seen guys get aggressive, you know, or they're like, you know, just get in their face and scare them. I just yeah. found that over the course of time, you're more successful building rapport than you are threatening people. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Hey, so, and that kind of leads me into a question I got for you. I know it's kind of a, a negative overall situation. It's got to be, but there had to be some cool shit that you saw. Like, did you ever see inmates kind of lending a kind hand to each other or picking each other up? Or there had to be some situations where they're just not shitting on each other, scamming. Yeah. Are you kind hear of stories thing. of how like sometimes inmates will come to the, the aid of a, of a guard that's getting attacked and things like that. So can you give us some examples of like some cool shit you saw behind bars? Like, damn, these, these people are human. I mean, obviously they are. Mm-hmm. And like you said, probably a lot of them are just good people that fucked up. Mm-hmm. But there's just this image of horrible things that happen. But what are some of the, the positive good things that you saw? Uh, whenever there's uh, snow is the, is the easy example. When it snows, somebody's got to shovel all that stuff. And like we have to clear it out. So everybody needs to get this done. Like the staff wants everything done. So the sooner they can shovel and get everything clear, the sooner we can go back to doing whatever it is we're doing. And the inmates, they would love to shovel because it's something to do. So we all got together, like, hey, let's all work together. We know you guys want to work. We can get this over with. We want this over with, too. So let us get you the supplies. And that's kind of one of those examples where we're all on the same page of working together. And I don't care, like, what your deal is. We're just here for a specific mission. There's And and in those cases, I'm not really worried about transactions or interactions because there's no time to plan that. So I know the ones that are doing this are doing this because they want to shovel. Mm. Like, they're pre-organized, like, interactions or anything like that so like, hey they're just here for that one reason so it's kind of weird so every time it does snow you, you were just all on the same page we're like hey let's you know let's get the cool. job done so that, what that, about, hey, you see a glimpse of the humanity there for a moment yeah everyone's yeah. kind of yeah same what about personally Eddie? i mean have you you know we've all seen the movies where it's like sometimes that guard takes a special interest and that dude like you know jimmy go get your gde you know go i mean have, do you have any personal stories where Maybe once in a while, you you just said, you know what, I I could maybe help this dude. Maybe just some advice, or maybe yeah, you get maybe the, the guy Dr. likes to fill somebody. Yeah, but yeah. maybe the guy you saw, he's writing, and you're a writer, and maybe you gave him some tips on how to be a better writer. You know, uh, that is a slippery slope because what we're always uh, harping on is not to cross that line. Ah. Oh, like favoritism, and then maybe there's yeah. they can corrupt same, the guards too. Like now they're yep. your friend and. Right. Hey, can you do me this favor? Can you please? Yeah, I bet that's got it. it and, and that's one of those things where, you know, there were some dudes like uh, this one guy. He was he was like the the outdoor cleaner outside the unit. So we relied on him a lot. So I built rapport with him over the years. And I was like, you know, if, if you weren't in here, we'd probably be friends on the outside. Uh, but he ended up getting high and killing his girlfriend. So I was like, oh, oh fuck. Yeah, yeah, probably, you know, <laughs> we'll separate on Friday nights. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you're you know cool, what? but besides that, <laughs> if you just yeah, didn't kill fun. people, we'd be bros. You know? 
it's funny you say that because you know when you when you work around these guys you build this weird relationship oh for sure yeah try to keep it professional so my running joke was hey when you get out of here you know you can come to a barbecue just promise me you won't kill anybody <laughs> <laughs> there's, tr- there's truth to that's that statement, awesome though. dude <laughs> hey did you ever bump into anybody on the outside when they got out do you ever like uh no only because i don't go out too much um i'll either go to the same spots with my same friends doing the same shit like i don't do too much travel around but that does happen um i I live in a pretty suburban area where some people do live in urban areas where they do run into that all the time i bet yeah but the places i i I go to and the things i do it doesn't really happen often but it does happen quite a bit to people and which is why they allow you to carry a weapon because there have been instances where oh yeah like oh that's the motherfucker yeah they come up and yeah yeah i was always worried about that more so when i was doing my plane clothes days i'm like i remember asking my my team leader like what happens if i bump into someone i'm working at like walmart man luckily i lived way north and i was working way south so it'd be a very odd kind of like it's not in certain places i'm not out hanging out in thug bars in south phoenix and stuff but i was always worried about that oh shit moment that you like at a restaurant, some dude walks in, you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> well, I, I also believe that if I ever did, I wouldn't worry too much about it because respect goes a long way in that environment. If you treat oh, yeah. people right. Yeah, it's true. You know, you have they have no reason to hate on you if you treat. Right. Uh, yeah. That's most- true. You know, I was big on that in the streets was. Uh, and one of the things I would say over and over is, hey, if you're cool with me, I'm cool with you. Yeah. And uh, and I think the way I looked, the, a lot of the guys that I was working around, uh, on the streets, they liked my tattoos. And a lot of people would say, I'm not talking to you, but I'll talk to that tattooed motherfucker. <laughs> so I was known as that tattooed motherfucker, but I always treated people well, even if it was a fight and I had to get them in cuffs. Soon it was, it was over. They're still humans. You still treat them with respect. And and so I'm sure you were the same way. Like you weren't a piece of shit belittling people. And you know, you but- seem like a, a mellow level headed dude. So you're right. I guess if you did meet someone, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have much to worry about because you didn't shit on them for, you know, right. However and, long they were in there. I but. treat them as humans first and, and respect goes on. And, and the fairness is another thing. Like if you're going to do this to one guy, you got to do it to everybody. Yeah. I was always big on that. So I never gave anybody a reason, but there have been guys where one example, um, he placed a shank. He was a brand new recruit. He tried to get into the whole intelligence game and he wanted to get back at this dude. Uh, he's not the not a bright officer, so he, he planted a shank in the guy's property. Mm-hmm. So when they went to go search it, they were like, oh, there's a shank. Like, that's no good. Um, so obviously, you know, if you know the system, if you're an inmate, you, you have rights. You know, they have the court system in there. You can call witnesses, do all that other stuff. And they question the officer. And they, the, the questions were, do you remember where it was in his property? And he's like, I don't recall. Do you remember what it looked like? I don't. Everything was, I don't recall. So they do uh, That's shady, yeah. Yeah, so now the guy's back in population, and he they come they cross paths again, um, and they had interactions. It wasn't violent, but the inmate's like, "I should kick your ass right now," because he could have. But you know, and the kid, you know, he learned a lesson like that. You're fucking yeah. with people. Was like that's just you know, it's not cool. And there's no need to do that. You know, they're already in a situation. Why make it worse? You know, even if yeah. you have a beef with them, you know. Right, he was trying to make a name, and he he went about it the wrong way. But you know, yeah, I've learned yeah. that respect goes goes much farther. Well, you you've mentioned the gangs. You've mentioned the the you know your shot callers, your kingpins. You know, Clark Clark and I were curious about the the one thing that hasn't been brought up. You know, a little bit of the gross stuff. You know, how butt how sex. Are, yeah, I, I mean, give me a break. <laughs> I, I mean, are there are there just got predators in there, or do they turn? How are they turning guys into? You know, bitches. I guess I I, I don't know. Uh, I would say. <laughs> The phrase uh, "gay for the stay" is pretty big. Um, what, what we had the it? same the same thing in the Navy. It's not gay if you're underway. You know, if you bang yeah. a dude on deployment, no big deal. You know, but don't do it stateside. That's gay. Well, I, I, I mean, bitches because they say I'm going to make you my bitch. It's not that. Don't worry for all you liberals out there. I'm not attacking women. Give me a break. I don't think any liberals <laughs> listen to us. I think we're safe. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, do they? Do they? Everyone that comes in, are they looking to make them? They're the bitch. I mean, how does that? work i mean it's creepy um it is and it does happen the thing is that no one reports it uh they have <sighs> called priya which is 
it's a federal thing. It, it goes on a level which is pre Prison Rape Elimination Act, where they try to institute these rules and these guidelines and protocols to prevent it, but majority of inmates aren't going to say anything because the last thing you want is to be labeled a snitch, which is why it's it's tough to get into you get raped more. <laughs> yeah, and now you're being labeled. Like What's the best way to keep your butt safe, man? I, they taught us if we ever in the military get captured to shit ourselves, that that would prevent us. From, so you recommend my first day in prison, I just shit myself and. <laughs> That would actually work. That would very much <laughs> just be the nasty, crazy dude. They'll be like, yeah, he's not worth it. Yeah, no, that would work. Cause, cause I would just complain to a lot. Like this guy's dirty. Like, no, there's not like, we're just here to, you know, we have a function. We can't make, you know, solve every problem. Is that, is that prison rape like a common thing or does it happen occasionally? Or I've always wondered, like, um, it's hard to put a number on something that's not reported. Oh, that's true. People, yeah, we, we can only suspect, and and usually the housing cop, when they see an inmate acting different or strange, that could be one of the reasons why. Oh, like, yeah, he has a routine. He just got a new cellmate. Now he's acting all weird, and he's not the same guy. So you put two to the other, but we're not trained to be like going after him. Like you know, I, I sense yeah. something. You know, it's more the business yeah. is more reactive. Like if it comes to us, we have protocols, but we're not looking for that kind of thing. So. Yeah. It happens for sure. Uh, sometimes they say some, but for the most part, they don't say anything. And it's a true. lot of I never it, thought of that. Yeah, it, it probably a lot like real rape. You know, I know there's a lot of, you know, gals, especially younger gals, high school gals. That stuff happens to them, and they're just they don't know what to do. They're ashamed, and hmm. so I'm sure it's the same on the inside. Like I know if I got raped, I wouldn't know what to do. I'd be like, fuck, man. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, but again, the, the whole gay for the stay thing, and that's what I said earlier, Ryan, was gay for the stay. A lot of it's mutual. But hey, man, you're in this position. I'm in this position. Let's make the most out of it kind of thing. So it's like it's not really rape if you're willing. And there's a lot more people that are willing in that environment where they <laughs> out. So if Barry White's uh, playing and you're on watch, you just basically uh, just walk by. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that does happen, especially on the overnight shift. It's like. Uh, really? Oh, I bet. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. When the like, lights go out, huh? So, yeah. The lights go out and they're not, not, there's less activity and they know that <laughs> you have a routine and it's, you know, they're not going to walk every five seconds. They're going to be down every hour or whatever they can. See, be. my luck, I would be in the cell right next to the people that fuck every night and I'd have to listen to it. Yeah, but they're, they're like, telling you, we're, we're arm wrestling, bro. I swear we're arm wrestling. <laughs> Why do you keep saying put it in my ass harder? Is that a weird arm wrestling technique? <laughs> and here's another uh, kind of code. Gross fact is strip searching is is a common like it, it comes with the territory whenever they go through a visit or a sensitive area they have to be strip searched mm. so to get strip searched they got to do the lift their balls uh lift their you know everything and then turn around spread, spread them. your cheeks oh what's the weirdest thing you saw in a butthole uh well before i get to that <laughs> One of the story was uh, you can tell which guys are <laughs> bottoms because it's it, it's it's like it's stretched. Oh, oh yeah, like you uh, can tell it's worn and, and it's it's gaping. You got the big yeah. old gape. Yeah, it's I've no seen longer, those videos. Yeah, it's no longer a balloon. That it's like just it's just yeah, it's know, just it's, a deflated hot air balloon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh so my god! You can god. tell which ones are, are, are champs at it. <laughs> the women champs. They're just. <laughs> Oh my oh god. god. I'm yeah. the Rocky of Cell Block P. Oh. <laughs> There's plenty of times where there's something sticking out, like either a plastic something or, or, or a balled up napkin. Like the we're not supposed to go in and pull it. You're supposed yeah. to pull it right. carefully and slowly you pull it out. And if they yeah. you, then you take them to medical and the medical kind of takes lead on. Is it most commonly drugs is what they're most they're of the smuggling? Time. Yeah. And, what about and, cell phones? Are they is that even a thing? Do they try to get not necessarily butt smuggling, but do they try to through visits or are cell phones a thing that they try to obtain? Is that one of the items? Cell phones are, are big, um, but they're hard to get. Um, but they're getting easier because the small the cell phones are getting smaller. Like there's one about the size of my thumb now. Mm. Know, the, the science is getting better. Technology. Yeah. Um, but cell phones are are the gold standard of contraband. So if you can get that, you're up there. And it's not hard. They're everywhere. They're just not a lot of them. Um, but if someone's lucky enough, they can manage to get one in. And they're there. It's just a matter of finding it. What well, other kinds of stuff are priorities for the inmates to try to get a hold of? Obviously, narcotics, cell phones. What are some items that 
maybe people aren't quite aware of that you found were commonly smuggled in? Um, jewelry sometimes. Uh, oh, sneakers. sure. Sneakers were big because uh, you can only order like the boring ones. Oh, shit. But they are brand name. They're Adidas and Nike. But like if they go to visit and somebody wears like this brand new like Jordans, they can do a quick swap. I'd say, yeah, swap them out. Yeah, oh, shit. Yeah, and then they go back and, you know. Make yourself know. a target, though. You start goose-stepping around in some Air Jordans, man. Seriously. You're going to get snatched up. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on your, your position in the hierarchy. If, oh, if that's you're true. That dude, mm-hmm. you get this off. It's just another symbol of your power. So, yeah, that's look, true, you're yeah. You're not going to be a Joe Schmo who's scared wearing these shoes because you're asking for trouble. Yeah. That is Nice, that, man. No, you know what? We all – past couple episodes or we've had people on the show such as tom and others uh, talk about just be- uh, mental resilience resiliency uh you know stress things like this you know first responders have some of the toughest jobs out there mentally but you know at least at the end of their shift they you know they get to go home like and how you get to go home but at least they also see some of the good within their job um your your type of job it's it's very tough to see good. You're surrounded by negative and, and, and bad all day. How did you stay positive? How did you stay on course and, and you know, just remain sane in a sense working in that environment? Um, completely, I don't. Um, but <laughs> one of the steps, <laughs> one yeah, of the steps wrong. is being aware of it. Now I'm aware of it. And when I first started that career, um, I thought, you know, I'm educated, I'm, I'm tough, you know, I've been through quite a bit, like nothing can change me, I'm invincible. Um, so I, that's how I carried myself the first few years. And when I got married in 2011, we went on a honeymoon and uh, we went on a cruise and we started in Barbados, St. Lucia, those islands. And um, in the prison system, dreadlocks are the thing, you know, that's just the fashion, everyone's got them. And if you go down those Caribbean places. Oh, you were like tripping out seeing dreadlocks. You're like, oh, fuck. Yeah, and I didn't <laughs> know it. Weird. But I was uncomfortable. I'm like, I don't like this. Something's not right. You know, sure. every wow. island. And by the time the trip was over, I'm like, man, everybody couldn't have been nicer. Like, everyone's just happy. Mm. But I went in there and with my guard up, I'm like, I just don't like this. Um, and it wasn't until years later where it just something clicked. I'm like, wait a minute. And maybe I, the job is affecting me because now I'm seeing these types of people with this certain fashion and attributing it to this type of person. And that's not well, subconsciously. You couldn't even put your finger on it at the time. Right. That, that's right. fascinating. Yeah. So I didn't know it at the time, but now, now I ask myself like, all right, why am I uncomfortable? Is it really that, or is it more about me? Cause sometimes it, it can go either way. And, <clears throat> but that's, that's how I start. And I do part of the writing is for me is a creative outlet. So that helps me, you know, adjust. And I'm like, all right, you know, as long as I get to do something else. And, you know, I don't know if you got Brad Thomas scheduled, but he talks about that where, you know, the things he's gone through and the things he's seen, he feels that he's not affected by any of it because he's so involved in the music. I bet. Yeah. His creative outlet. And he's been doing it before and now he does it again. And that's his way of doing it. And I kind of see the same thing, but with the writing, the writing is kind of your, how you process all that. It's therapeutic. It, you know yeah yeah it's therapeutic it's just a creative outlet something yeah. to get my mind off it. and there's guys that turn to the bottle you you know that oh yeah dude, i did that for years man i crushed myself with it especially when i was a cop it was in the military it was very social right. i was on trips and with the boys and but as a cop i was very isolated you know because we lived in we lived so far apart from each other plus you just spent 40 hours plus with those dudes you didn't want to see them again and, uh, you know, I just I was tired of going out with my days off. It, it sucked to go out on a Tuesday night anyway. So I started to kind of isolate myself. And, and, and it's very common in law enforcement to uh, to get sucked into that. So I'm sure it's the same in your guys ecosystem. A lot of guys get sucked into that, which, oof, you know, anyone that's listening, that's a young corrections guy or a young officer, even young military man. Just be careful with that stuff, man. It, it uh, I painted myself in the corner with it for sure for years, man. Yeah, and that, that that was the one thing I used to harp on, you know, as I got older and more seasoned. Mm-hmm. Supervisor, every new class that came in every few months. Give them a heads up about it, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I don't care how tough you are, I don't care how smart you are, the job will change you. And it's okay, just be aware of it and don't let it change you too much. You know, because yeah. there are guys that don't stand up to an inmate when they're supposed to. They don't confront them at the right time. Um, and they just kind of internalize it and then they go home and they're like, you know, why are you doing this to your spouse or your kids? 
you know, yeah. and, you know they, it's hard they, to separate that sometimes, you know, I caught myself, especially as a cop, as a soldier, I was pretty isolated from my family half around the world. But as a cop, I mean, as soon as your shift is over 30, 40 minute drive home, now you're in the house and it was hard to just flip that switch and not be, you know, that cop as a parent, as a husband and all that. So I'm sure it's the same for you guys. When your shift's over, you go home and it's really tough to get out of that mode. Like it's not a switch. They used to tell us, you know, don't forget to turn the switch off. I'm like, there ain't no switch, dude. Especially <laughs> if you had a rough shift, yeah. you know, some shifts you come home like what the fuck. And then as soon as your foot's in the door, wife's yelling at you about the credit card or who's this text message to, or you just like, ah, it's not my, you know, it's tough. Yeah. That's what I tell the newbies. I'm like, yeah, everything's good now. You live at home. You're making better money than you ever have. Uh, you know, you, your life's simple. You get to party because you never had this money. And there's nothing but good things. And then over time, you get, you know, you buy a home. Now you got a mortgage or a rent or you get married. Mm -hmm. and now all that stuff is compiling. Add that to work. So it's, it's no extra stress. Yeah. So, yeah. Can I you tell us a little bit about kind of how you promote it up? I mean, I know you ended up. I think as a lieutenant. So can you talk to us about when you were a regular corrections dude and then you, you bumped up to sergeant, which is at least in law enforcement where I came from, that's kind of the backbone of the department, the Thank sergeants. You. And then up from there to uh, lieutenant is a significant jump. You know, I know for working for Phoenix, you know, to make lieutenant was like, holy shit, like it was a big deal. So can you kind of walk us through that sequence of events for you? Yeah. And this is what I, I, I one of the reasons why I wrote this book, um, because as you know, with a lot of government entities and organizations, everything is about fairness and everything is about controlling. Um, there is no, for the most part, there is no uh, a selection process where we're going to interview this person. It's like, we're going to have a test. So literally that's what it comes down to in most departments, especially in our state, which is if you take this test and you don't have any major disciplinary infractions, if you do well enough, you will get promoted. There's nothing stopping you because there's a commission that it's called the civil service commission that oversees this um, promotion system. So that's really all you need. And one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because uh, I saw the people that were getting promoted, you know, they might have been on the third shift where they did, got the chance to read everything and study more than. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So now they're going from doing nothing to being in charge. So that's when I started to see in the same mistakes that I was making as a lieutenant in Iraq, you know, and a lot of it was simple stuff, um, you know, micromanagement, the way you talk to people and the way you follow up. So I used, uh, you know, I learned that in Iraq and then I used that going forward. But when I got to the department, I saw the same mistakes because now you're, you're really giving somebody authority that may not have the actual experience to do it right. That is very common. Yeah. 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 So I saw it all the time. And at the time I'm like, how do you not know, what to do like this is so easy but then i took a step back I'm like, well maybe because i know i've been there before yeah. me as an officer is speaking um so i'm like how do you not know but then again i went through this phase i went through this learning curve that everyone has to go through some better than others so that's when i decided to write the book i'm like yeah, what what book did you write what's the name of it if people want to yeah where can you get it, it. Um, so on the ass i have it right here it's a beginner's guide to leadership oh nice um, and it's basically my story from the lessons I learned overseas. Um, then I refine them in the department and it's really meant for somebody that has absolutely no idea what they're doing and want to have like some type of foundation to go off to, to start with. Um, and that's nice. when I decided to write it. I'm like, maybe I know more. I'll just write. Cause at the time I was already comfortable with writing. Yeah. Can they get that from your website? Is it on Amazon or what's the best way to. Uh, it is also it is on Amazon, but it's also on my website, eddiemolina.com. So they can go from there. If they order it on the website, I'll sign it. I mean, oh, nice. nice. Eddie, hold it up one more time so our YouTubers sure. see it. Nice. Yeah, I'm going to grab a copy of that. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. That's so, uh, awesome. I just got off the, the Zoom right before you guys. There's another Navy SEAL who reached out to me about writing a book. And I just, we sat and chatted for a good 45 minutes. Um, you know about the process and i was like it's not was it long. was his first name rob by any chance it was not rob <laughs> okay you know what i have a, i have a buddy rob who wants to write a book on leadership and i thought oh, shit i wonder because you seem to know everybody so <laughs> i was like maybe rob hit him up that's cool yeah no i, I mentioned the guys uh 
your name to him. He didn't know who you were. He, he looked like our age. He had gray hair and maybe he mm. even looked older. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, if you're not from the same team, it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty hard to know each other, especially opposite coasts and stuff. But, uh, but that's cool. I'm glad more guys like yourself or that other SEAL dude are writing books because I think the, the ecosystems we come from, you have to have a unique style of leadership. And I think that the civilian culture could benefit from that, take bits and yep. pieces from it. Obviously not all of it, but I think the the founding principles of leadership that you learned in the military, you learned in the correction systems, I think is very valuable, especially for young people that maybe are going into the corporate world, but don't really know like, shit, what's, what's ahead of me. What's, what's exactly. above me. Like, who are these people? Yep. Who are these leaders? And, right. And I think there are some really strong principles through military leadership and even in law enforcement, they're really kind of cousin communities. I mean, law enforcement's kind of paramilitary with its structure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's what brought me into it. I thought, well, what am I going to do stateside? I mean, fuck, I go work at Home Depot. I don't know what to do. So right. I thought, oh, law enforcement, you know, at least it's familiar enough. You know, the job is very different, but the structure is very similar. So I, I definitely want to read your book. I'll order one from you and, yeah, no, me out. too. And I, I think what's great, it doesn't matter what game you're trying to learn or what ladder. So it doesn't matter if it's military, law enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurial, or if you're going to play the corporate game. There's a game to every system. There's a structure. Yeah. There's a structure. So the thing mm -hmm. is, you know, just if you're a business dude, don't just read business leadership books that have been written by business guys. Go read the leadership book by the military guy, the law enforcement guy, and vice versa. If you're going into law enforcement and leadership, get the business dude's book. Because if the more playbooks you read on the different styles, you know, you'll see which one adapts to the situation or which one applies to the situation because it, the game changes and, and there's not one playbook. So, Eddie, I think that's extremely fascinating. I definitely want to read that because uh, I have I've yet to read a leadership book uh, from from your side of, uh, you know, the fence there in, in uh, corrections or coming from that point of view. So, yeah, definitely excited for that. Yeah, yeah, check it out. Um, I put my heart and soul into it and it's a quick read. It's it's 40,000 words so you can get it done in a couple of days it's not a it's not a long you know dictionary so it's, it's a read. it does it come audiobook because i i like to listen while i drive but is it an audiobook yet no but you're like the 10th person that asks and uh so i should get on that <laughs> okay it's a popular format yeah because a lot of people yeah. commuting and stuff for sure but uh that's yeah. awesome man what do you have your hands in any new cookie jars any projects that you're currently working on or that you want to work on well, we, uh, Ryan and I were talking earlier. I am um, starting a business venture, which is a little scary, but I've been looking into doing this for a long time. So it's just, it's funny you call me now because I'm literally almost ready to get it going. I'm just a few short months away, nice. uh, but it's going to be a whole career change. It's going to be a whole new environment, everything. And when you're in your forties, it's kind of scary because you got kids and, you know, your family yep. and everything else involved. I think Ryan told me earlier you were going to become a Ghostbuster. Is that <laughs> the new... I wish I was looking for three good good partners. You guys in? I'm totally I'll do it in. Too. Man. Hell yeah! I'm in. I'll move out to Jersey and be a Ghostbuster with you, Eddie, anytime, man. You know, but Eddie, we're we're talking, and it's it's worth bringing it up again. And again, I I had to stop you and actually say, "Wow!" When you, we were talking offline before going live, but you know, it it's really interesting to me when guys like you are about to go into entrepreneurism. And you said, you know, it's a little scary. And, and my reply to you is like, wait a second, you, you work in a prison. And, and just the <laughs> thought of the what ifs and the unknown in the business you're starting is actually more scary to you. You know, that that's fascinating. So what would your advice be to anyone out there that's in a situation like yours? Again, contemplating, but I'm scared. What what advice would you have from a, a guy who has to face fear every day? Um, be prepared that's that's the one thing and, I, and i've been preparing i've been planning researching and the same thing goes for business and i believe that as long as you do the homework and you you, you do the research and you lay everything out it should be fine the same thing with law enforcement even military know what you're getting into be prepared take the training serious like because there's a reason why they train you you know you might run into it hopefully you don't but you might um but all of its preparation planning and then once you have that under your belt, then confidence follows it. And then that's what should get you past it. That's what yeah. I believe it. No, that's great advice. And and by the way, as we're talking, I just ordered your book. So oh, cool. it's it's going to come. Um, looking at this now, I mean, um, 
and again, I've read different leadership books, but um, th it's kind of interesting on how you've broke things down on the the different type of it seems like personalities uh, from from uh, you know brown nosers to to identifying leaders to even body language, um, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting because the world you live in, you're right. There's classifications, but the art of reading people with body language, um, I don't. I don't think that's discussed so much in leadership programs, so it's almost neglected, but people that have gone through either military training or law enforcement training, the learning to classify and then identify body language is, is almost like intelligence in a sense yeah. and would make you a better leader. So what, what made you, you know, want to expand on that in your book? Uh, I have a background in sales back when I was in my meathead days, you know, doing this at the club. <laughs> Jaeger bomb. You know, I was in sales at the time. And um, yeah, you, you talk to people every day and you try to get them to do certain things. And I started noticing, especially in New Jersey, New Jersey is a weird uh, melting pot of community. There's heavy Indian population here, heavy Asian. There's everything. It's not one dominant um, race out here. And I started to notice, I'm like, when I go up to this Asian person and it wasn't just one in particular, but any Asian person, they would like step back and then mm. I would go up again and they would step back again. And I, and I, and I got to a point where I'm like, this is kind of interesting. Cause like it's their culture. Like I was invading their body language, but some other race uh, cultures, they would get up in my face to be like, yeah, oh, Italians, bro, that's my yeah. Italians like, are right in your mug. You're like, Hey, look. Right. <laughs> it started off like, Learning that, I'm like, wow, but like, now I know when I'm talking with this type of person, I may have to take in consideration what my body language is saying and not just the words I'm saying because they're going to receive it a certain way if they're uncomfortable versus if they are comfortable. And then I started looking at other cues like their hands, if they're crossed, their legs, if they're crossed, if they're not facing to you. And that's all part of communication, which I doubt anybody would disagree that leadership is a big part of, you know, how you communicate both sure. in what you're saying and the message you're receiving. Yeah. Verbal, nonverbal. You know, there's there's actually books uh, also, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know, written by, you know, those uh, FBI behavioralists, you know, on the nonverbal right. communication. So, uh, and, and again, in Clark, we've kind of talked about this online, offline, and Eddie, I'm sure you know, I'm sure, you know, your training too is recognizing some of those nonverbal cues. Are they, are they a threat? That was huge in law enforcement. Not yeah. so much in the teams, man. You know, we just kick in the door and shoot you. But <laughs> as a cop, you got to talk to people and you can tell a lot by their posture, by just like you said, hands. If they kneel down and start tying their shoes, <laughs> you yeah. know, the first time you're like, fuck is this guy? Oh, shit, he's gone. You know what I mean? It's just little, they look over their shoulder, like they're looking to see where they're going to go or just, fidgety hands like you said there's so many things the more you work the streets or in your case like it's a very contained environment you know you have a shot of whiskey where the streets is like a watered down beer it's just it's kind of scattered but where your your ecosystem is intense and so i'm sure body language is even more important but for us we really work in the streets we learn a lot about people just the way they talk the way they look and not stereotypical stuff, but their mannerisms, it really becomes important when you're interviewing someone, you can just, you get a sense for it. It's really a sixth sense, but I never thought to apply it to, like you said, a leadership. Cause I've never, I've always been the middle guy. I've always been the sled dog. You know, I've never, I never, <laughs> I, when I made E5 in the Navy, I knew I was going to make E4 before E6. I was going back down that scale. I never did surprisingly. I don't know how, but uh, I always enjoyed just that middle you were senior enough that you didn't have to do the crap crap. You got to do the cool shit, but you weren't too senior where, you know, you kind of slipped on the other side of that and you had to watch other people do the cool shit. But yeah. uh, one of the reasons why I went uh, OCS, the officer, because I remember being a PFC and I remember thinking, I'm like, this guy's a fucking idiot, you know, and not to be <laughs> mean, but, you know, he's an NCO and nicest guy in the world. I'm like, he has no, like, nice oh, dude, yeah. but he has no clue what he's doing. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not in a position like I just I gotta do it. You know, if that's what you say. I'm gonna do it. So then I was like, maybe I gotta put myself, and that's where you know yeah. I leave this. Either deal with it or put yourself in a position to do something about it. Those are really your two choices. That's well, true. Yeah, I mean, no, that's good. And they need people like you to be in leadership roles because, you know, 
being a young enlisted guy in the military, you're like, why the fuck are we doing this shit? Now, sometimes there's a purpose for it, for sure. But sometimes it's just stupid shit. So there were times I wish I could, like, become a colonel real quick and be like, all right, this is stupid. We're not yeah. doing this. So I'm glad that you actually stepped up and did it because I was one of the guys that was painting rocks, just bitching about it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the other choice you have. And <laughs> God I, I damn it. Like, just deal with it or do something. <laughs> you know, what, Eddie, these these books are awesome. Um, and whenever I get a chance to talk to an author who puts books out like this, I, I like to ask him a question to, you know, basically paint a picture uh, so, you know, people could learn from it. Um, you put out a book about leadership. What from your past experience, be it the military or the corrections, where you face an extremely challenging leadership uh, issue, and how did you resolve it? Hmm. Tough leadership issue. Really? Um, you know, military could have been insubordination. Yeah. Could it be, you know, guys not respecting your authority? Probably morale is a big one, huh? I mean, as a leader, you always got to kind of keep the guys moving in the, you know, same I think direction. My, or my, my toughest challenges and um, were in the military because really we had a pretty boring deployment. Uh, we were in charge of detainees that were part of the Saddam's regime, which is what I joke around with Tom because I'm like, oh, dude, you caught these guys, and here I am babysitting them, and they're just now <laughs> boring dudes. Thanks for dumping these assholes off on my doorstep, bro. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, so our tempo went from, you know, we're doing this high speed training leading up to it. And then we get in country in Iraq and it just came to a complete stop. And we're sitting there like these, these guys are terribly boring. <laughs> so the morale was a problem, number one. Uh, number two, I went straight from uh, graduating right into training, right into the deployment. So I didn't know anybody. I didn't know my soldiers. I knew a couple guys because we were in the guard together but I didn't have a chance to like learn who they are in a training environment. Cause once I graduated uh, artillery school, I made up caught, caught up with my unit who was training in, in Fort bliss. And I was already three weeks late. So I had to catch up and meet everybody. And then we were there for another two weeks. Um, so I had two weeks at Fort bliss. Then we went to Kuwait, <clears throat> excuse me for a few more weeks. Uh, so now we're going into the deployment. So I'm like, man, I've only had like a little Damn. to go oh, with, you know, were in like a more of a high speed dynamic battle zone it would have been ugly because I, I don't know who's strength i don't know shit and that's the thing with butter bars you don't know what you don't know and then at I least thought, you knew that though a lot of butter bars don't you knew that because oh, you were prior enlisted you know that a mustang yeah. is very valuable yeah right and and even then like the enlisted part was limited because i was only pfc i just you know i didn't have any type of uh nco experience which i think makes the best officers Oh, true. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't really know too much, but over time, you know, a few months, I'm like, oh shit, now I know that I didn't know shit. And that's why I see butter bars getting no respect because they, they really don't know shit and I didn't either, but eventually you learn. And mm. that's where I was. So that was the most challenging times as a leader. Cause like now I'm in charge. We have an oversized platoon. This fucking deployment is terribly boring. Like everyone's morale is dumped. We're working 12 hour days. Plus we got, formations throughout the day like on the off time and if something happens we have to have an accountability formation and then the shit starts over the next day and if you're lucky you might get off every sixth day but usually once a week at the most oh, how long were you in country for was it a long deployment no it was 10 months this was uh 2008 yes. to 9 which at that point any reserve unit they couldn't do more than 12 months including training up prior to oh, that wow. no, there is no limit Damn. Yeah, it's, it's still pretty good one, man. Our our average deployments were about six months. So yeah. by comparison, that's pretty easy compared to 10 months is a pretty good stretch. But yeah, there were dudes I think did like 18 months or fuck, yeah. dude. Yeah, and there, were, there were guys I was Ooh. in their second deployment. And the first one, they were in Sodder City and they were there for 18 months. Ugh. National Guard dudes. So like we lost guys that, that first deployment. Um, that's when I got back to the unit, but I wasn't with them. I was mm -hmm. uh, eight side and uh, then I went to OCS, but um, yeah, they were just like, like what were artillery guys in the reserve? Yeah. Never going to, are we here for 18 months? Yeah. Shouldn't the army be doing this? Yeah. It's gotta yeah. be. Cause you join the guard with certain expectations. Like you said, you kind of want to live two lifestyles, you know, you still want to do your thing, but you want to serve and it serves a good function. And I always wondered being an active duty cat, we'd see a lot of national guard dudes 
and it confused me. And I've never really spoken to a national guard guy, a guardsman. Um, my initial concept of the national guard was to guard the nation, right? Kind of a defensive unit right. so that when the active duty troops are forward deployed, there's still a military present stateside so that we can't just get sucker punched. Like right now, Russia's like, Oh yeah. Hey, everyone's overseas fighting Arabs. Let's go fuck them up. I kind of thought that was the concept of the national guard was to be that defensive linebacker that sits back in the homeland. And that way, if the other guys are, you know, half way around the world, I mean, is that the basic concept of the National Guard is to kind of just be that defensive unit no matter what? Uh, it is primarily a state function. Uh, we answer to the governor. Um, but at any time, the federal will go, well, you know, we're bigger. We're the big brother. You're just the brother. So they could yeah. take We're snatching your people up. You just got to deal with it. Damn. And that so happens that's, that the federal government is the one then that deploys you guys overseas. They'll call the governor and say, hey, we need these dudes to drive around Iraq and get blown up or something. Yep, and then it will be put on federal active duty status as uh, National Guardsmen, which happened to everybody because we relieved uh, Wisconsin National Guard. And, I'm sorry, we relieved Oklahoma, and then Wisconsin relieved us. So it was just National Guard units all over the place. With the hey, what do you think about the situation? You know, we're hearing all these rumors about the Guardsmen out there in D.C. <laughs> the thing that concerns me is not necessarily the political reasons why they're there, which is why everyone's fighting over uh, my concern is the the I don't know what word I'm looking for, kind of the the quality of care they're getting. You know, you see these pictures of these poor dudes sleeping in stairwells and and things like that. Do you have any insight as to kind of what's going on there? Like why I know why they were initially put there, but how long do you think they'll be there for? And and why do they seem to be getting does the guard just get shit on in general? Like, why Why aren't these dudes, you know, if Delta Force was there, they wouldn't be sleeping in no damn stairwells. You know what I mean? Like, what? what's up with, why are they treating our guardsmen so bad out there? Um, I think that's just the function of the way the guard operates. We were an artillery unit. So all we did was train artillery, which is one thing I never understood. I'm like, we're used half the time for these state issues, like a hurricane or some type of natural disaster. But we yeah. never we're just used as bodies like all right we just need people here um but there's no train up there's no protocol there's no guidance to how do you use national guardsmen other than here's a a bunch of people for you they have their own equipment and they can just manage to just show up and figure so a lot of it you guys just whether it's civil yeah. unrest or natural disasters even though you're not trained in it they're like hey send these dudes over and then you guys have to be like what the fuck do we know about hurricane shit it's got to be and that's how you end up sleeping somewhere. It's like, all right, well, we're here. Don't, don't give a shit. You just, yeah, curl yeah. up somewhere. If it was trained, like, they would say, okay, well, send the support units out there to get, you know, <laughs> punk from Paris or, or pop or something. And then said, but no, they just shove people there, and then they figure it out as they go along. So all those images were probably the first few weeks, you know, before they got things figured out. I'm sure by now I'd like to believe that things are a little bit more settled and situated. Uh, but that's just the function of the guard is just like that's kind of typical though for you guys because you get thrown into random shit but then immediate or not immediately but after a while people will say hey man get these guys in some hotels or barracks or something something and it's usually just a cot in a spot that's all you need is your space and i'm um, sure we had hurricane sandy in 2000 i think 11 or 12 oh yeah that was, yeah. That was devastating for new jersey uh, mm -hmm. we never seen anything like that so we went to the armory and we just showed up and, uh, you know, all right, now we got to figure out we need power. We got to do all this stuff. And by the time I got there, I was a week late because they, they didn't need me at first. Mm -hmm. um, but in the beginning, there was no system in place at all. And they're like, I was sleeping out of my van. I was like, either that or sleep on a cot or on the floor or somewhere in one of these offices. And it's just like, anyway. Good call on the van, bro. That's what I would do. I'd get the AT <laughs> van and rip out that metal seat and just. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, funny story we uh, started a podcast back in 2009 we didn't realize how ahead of the time we were and there were yeah. seven just young dudes all we do it, it was kind of like Howard Stern we were just bullshit <laughs> oh, you guys, we just didn't interview anybody we had a theme uh, and uh, we bought this van as part of like that we were trying to like all right this is the party van we're gonna hang out as <laughs> yes <laughs> nice dude we used to call it the rape van because it is <laughs> Pretty well, candy. you could back then. It was funny. Yeah. Now people yeah, are like, funny, oh my but... God. Oh, shit. Yeah. So that was part of our, our thing. 
Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I finally get to use this fucking thing for the first time, like legitimately. Otherwise, we were just taking it to bars and stuff. That's what we did. We would have got along great in our 20s, Eddie. I mean, we get along now, but we're at least we're past our scary. shenanigans. But we would have been double trouble back in the day, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. And yeah, your I, bombs in the 18 van. <laughs> I, I still have that bug in me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hanging out with a couple army dudes. Who I haven't seen. We kind of like all spread out, and they happen to be coming over this weekend. So they're, they're, they're oh here. shit, so we're gonna retro it up tonight and just hit the scene and just act like idiots. Yeah, so, good. You got to. You got to come out of retirement time to time when the when the boys are back together for sure. Oh yeah, yep. <laughs> Give it the old the old try. Yeah, and then in about twenty four hours, I'm like, the fuck am I doing, man? I'm forty two. Like, when shit. you have a, like a three day hangover, you're like, fuck. I'm, am I I'm telling you, you, man, you got to run out. I swear, Pedialyte. Okay, it's not just for babies. Yeah. Go slam. liquid IV too. Liquid IV yeah. is a lifesaver, there you man. Go. I, I pee pre like game some liquid back. IV or get a real IV if you can. If you got a medic buddy, man, Shit. we used to do that. We had a friend oh, yeah. uh, who was one of those medic dudes, and he would <laughs> take those all the time. We would get drunk and just hook up to IVs for no reason. And yeah, like it helps the next day, though, it man. Does. Our medics taught me that when I was a new guy in the teams, man. Double bagging it, you just lay in there like ah. Yeah, but now it they you feel human, you know. Now they have these places charge you two hundred bucks just to go sit down and get an IV. I know. What a great idea! That should have been a business plan. <laughs> that is the Good Vibes IV Center. <laughs> That's right. We'll put some sparkly shit in it. <laughs> I, have, I have heard Pedialyte though. Though someone else has uh, it's said that Pedialyte, it's yeah. awesome, man. I like no doubt. You got to just do an experiment. Go try it tonight because you know you're going to be a booze hound. <laughs> I will. I will. I, Pre-game I, some hydration, bro. Yeah. Uh, I, I do. I did put a 15-minute uh, clip of our podcast on my website. If you're curious, I, I listen oh, to it now, and it's hilarious. I'm on it right now. <laughs> where I'm on your website right now. So where is this? Oh, dude. Uh, if you awesome. scroll to the bottom, you'll see a bunch of YouTube. Uh, okay. <laughs> one called the Grass Circle. I'm gonna. I, I'm. I will. I will watch it, and it, we'll get this on YouTube. But it's. You said it's called the what? The garage circle. Oh, we got to put a clip on the YouTube version of this thing. We got a garage gotta... circle. Yeah, you know what? We used to hang out at my friend. He used to rent this garage. Um, we were <laughs> oh, keep... I I see it. <laughs> yeah, and the upstairs, there was no bathroom in this building, so we used to pee out the window. The same window we used to pop out. We used to pee out. <laughs> but we used to hang out at the in the attic and just drink like idiots. And oh, that sounds every awesome. Time we hang out. We always gravitate towards each other, and we're like, yeah, well, this is the garage circle again. We're just. Because we go yeah. to a party with like 50 people and it would be the same six or seven dudes that we all were like, why are we even here? Which, <laughs> that's why we call it the garage circle. That's great. <laughs> I love it. Bloopers and outtakes. We're going to have to give that a, a listen. Oh, yeah. We'll have to put that together. <laughs> well, listen, Eddie, we've had you long enough, brother. I really appreciate you coming on. And yeah. And above all else, I just want to thank you for being the third member of our group here for, for so long. We had to pull the curtain back and reveal you to the world, but you've yep. been very kind to support me and ryan and and taking care of us and so we wanted to give you a hug back but also you had an interesting story that we had previously talked about and uh i only knew my one buddy from colorado so i'm glad when we found out your career path we're like bam it's we get two birds with this one so yeah yeah, it was was cool man i never really aired it out like that but it is it is interesting that that's for sure that's why i put an article about i'm like there's so much shit and when i put that article i sent you with the 13 bullets I did that under someone else's name because I didn't want you know anyone from the department. Like, how could you, you know? Oh, no gotcha. Tentative, but I am calling some areas out. Like, yeah. My one thing is, you know, internal affairs. They know everything. They know who's doing what. Out all yeah. the moving. It's another story. Um, yeah. But they already know. Um, that was one of them. So I, I didn't want them to feel a certain type of way. But at this point, I'm like, fuck it. Uh, <laughs> you gotta love it and five tribe out there uh more about eddie go to eddiemolina.com and honestly get his book up, yeah get his get book, book uh a beginner's guide to leadership uh i just got it on amazon so it's that makes it easy for everyone no excuse uh and hey have one for me have one for clark you know so you owe us two <laughs> I'll, I'll do that like before i hang up i <laughs> my man that's awesome man we'll have fun tonight tell the fellas we said what's up and, and thanks Absolutely. Again, eddie you're awesome brother look forward to working with you more in the future man you're always yeah. welcome back I- take care Get easy dude oh yeah i know that you will yeah well the dude abides <laughs>